Hello and welcome, a very warm welcome to St. John's Online. My name is Esther Pryor and I'm the vicar here at St. John's Church in Egham. It's a privilege as ever to have this moment during the day to pause and just lay the tools of life down for a moment and spend time in God's word and in prayer and find fuel for picking up the tools again. I really pray that our time spent in John's Gospel today will really be a blessing, one that we carry into the responsibilities of our lives, whatever they may be. If you'd like to catch up on any of our broadcasts, you can find us on our YouTube channel, St. John's Egham. For now, let's take a moment to actively, intentionally enter into this space, into this time, made consciously laying down those tools of life, putting aside the things that distract, that might hinder our listening, our growing, our praying. inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit very intentionally so opening ourselves to his power at work within us Lord, we give you this time. We pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would stir our hearts to prayer and our hands to action. We ask this for the glory of Jesus. Amen. And so we come to our reading, and as I said, we are in John's Gospel, and we are now in chapter 15, starting from verse 1. So John 15, reading verses 1 to 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. 
I'm going to be really brave today and completely go off, off script. I had prepared something, but as I read that, I thought we might be better served to just pay attention to these words um, rather than what I had prepared. This conversation takes place after Jesus had left the upper room with his disciples. They're headed towards the Garden of Gethsemane and we are told that Jesus would have chosen the path of, sorry, that he would have walked through uh, a place with vines. And as you probably know, Jesus did a lot of his teaching by just pointing to the world around him. And at this time of the year, the vines would have been in blossom, promising the fruit that was to come. Maybe pointing to the vines in front of them in those dark alleyways of Jerusalem. Jesus using imagery from the Old Testament points to himself as the true vine and his father as the gardener. Again, connecting his work very much with the story of God and his people, but also very intimately with God himself. And the gardener well, his job is to cut off any branches that don't bear fruit. His work is one of pruning so that the fruit might be even more fruitful. That's just something to pause and think about, isn't it? And maybe to wonder if some of the hard times we find ourselves in, if submitted to the head gardener, might prove to be pruning times that God can use for our fruitfulness. Jesus echoes what had gone on in the upper room in verse 3. You're already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And that just invokes images, doesn't it, of him cleaning his disciples' feet. Maybe even bringing to mind that uncomfortable conversation that one of them was beyond pruning. One of them would be cut off from him. One of them would bear no fruit because Jesus said that not every one of them was clean. And we know already from the story that that person was Judas. He goes back in verse four to uh, the beginning sentence there about himself being the true vine. He's talked about the father being the gardener but what does that mean about him being the true vine? Well, the implication is we are the branches of that vine and that if we are going to remain fruitful, we have to remain connected to Jesus. This reminded me of when my son was little and he went through a phase of wanting to have a stick with him all the time. And I remember thinking how that stick always picked up from the floor, but used to be part of a trunk, part of a life system that kept it alive. But removed from that life system, it was just a dead piece of wood. And Jesus is saying very provocatively, that if we don't want to end up like that branch that is just a stick that has no use really except maybe for a fire, we need to remain connected 
to the vine. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. And that image of my son's stick, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and it withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We spoke about this yesterday. We'll speak about it again tomorrow. But this idea that if we ask, we will receive. And that I think that sometimes we behave as if God is some kind of personal genie and we can just rub him and out will come our dearest wish. And I think verse 7 really brings home the point that I was trying to make yesterday, that there's something about a life that's immersed in God whose wishes become completely intertwined with the will of God so that whatever we wish is steeped in the life of God. And there's assurance here that uh, if we use the keep the image of the vine in branches, there's life flowing through the vine that flows into the branches that bears fruit. And if you think of that uh, life flowing through the branch as the will of God flowing through the vine into the branches and bearing fruit, it's almost a natural process, just like a, a a tree is designed, if it's a healthy tree, to produce fruit. And this business of abiding, of God's will being what we desire, Jesus tells us, is all for the Father's glory. We read that in verse 8. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing your, yourselves to be my disciples. Another theme that's repeating today, we'll repeat again tomorrow, is the theme of love. In the upper room, Jesus told his disciples, a new commandment I give you, you are to love one another. And now Jesus is expounding on the basis of that love. His father has loved him, so I have loved you. And this remaining is remaining in love. And we remain in his love by keeping his commandments. There's a link between obedience, abiding, loving. Just as I have kept my father's commandments, Jesus says, I've remained in his love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So there's something about recognizing Jesus as the source of our lives, of our will, of our desires, of our love choosing to remain connected to him, which results in joy. He is the vine, we are the branches. The invitation is to remain in him and the result is fruitfulness. I can never read this without thinking of the fruit that Paul talks about in Galatians. If we remain connected to Jesus, we will live fruitful lives, lives that produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. 
I wonder, are you interested in living such a life? If you are, the secret is in abiding in the true vine. Amen. We come to our time of prayer and this week we've been giving thanks for those in the nursing profession and I want us to pray for nurses today. If you know a nurse, would you hold them up by name before God in prayer? such a noble profession. Nurses combine courage with compassion as they go about their daily tasks. They instill hope as they care for their patients. We thank God for them today. We pray that God would comfort them even as they comfort those under their care. What a year to have been a nurse. And I'm sure many are processing the trauma of the last year. We pray for God's consolation, healing of memories. We pray for energy and strength to continue serving with grace. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And using our Bible verse for the year, we continue to pray for one another and for ourselves that we would all have an increasing realization that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray for God's will to be done in our lives, for us to desire his will so that whatever we ask, he will do. We pray using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Tomorrow we'll continue uh, the next instalment of that walk from the upper room to Gethsemane as Jesus walks through the streets of Jerusalem with his disciples. For now, I'll say goodbye and may God bless you. <music>